Big surprise, unless you've already been on the D12 website. Uh, I posted the exam for you to work on over spring break and the following week. So if you're going to Florida, forget about it while you're going to Florida or wherever else. Um, but then don't forget about it when you come back, obviously. Um, so I, I posted it there. I sent an email, and I'm going to pass it out as well. This should be full there. Uh, and I'm going to go over this very quickly. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because we're so far behind. I mean, we're supposed to be almost done with Middle English stuff by now. Um, Intriguing. That's one word I would not use. Um, <laughs> and I still haven't decided I might post for you, since you're going to be having fun, you know, Lectures to watch on spring break. Uh, a lot of fun there. And I'm serious. I might post lectures for Lawn Vol and Sir Down in the Green Knight. Um, but I really hate to do that because there's so much fun to talk about. Um, so I don't know. Everybody have one of these? And is that cheat going around? Okay, so this covers everything from the beginning till now. To, to the end of now. End of today. So the stuff that we read about by bead, um, the conversion story of Edwin and Paulinus, you know, the stuff about Koifu and the monks and such, Cadman's Miracle and him, the Wanderer's Seafarer, Dream of the Root, and Beowulf. So, choose one topic and write a 750 to 1,000 word. And then the one I put online, it says no more, no less. So don't go over, don't go much under. Um, response that has a clear thesis is well supported by the text. Use parenthetical citation. We're excited. And it's free from errors as best as you can. Uh, you need to have at least five quotations, not paraphrases, but exact quotations, from at least two different works or more, depending on what the question is, because the question might say three words. Okay? Papers due at the beginning of class on Thursday, two weeks from today. So it should give you plenty of time. It's pretty short. And I will add, I'll allow this. You can expand your response to this for your semester slash term paper. Because this isn't going to involve any research. This is just you and the text. Okay? That longer paper, obviously, one hopes, uh, will require some research because if one doesn't do it, then one will get a very easy grade. It won't be a happy grade, but it'll be an easy grade. Uh, and I've also included in the electronic version for you, and you can type all this in if you want, Tolkien's essay, Beowulf, the Monsters, and the Critics. And that's because there's one topic that refers to it, and if you want, you can actually read it to see what Tolkien actually says. So, here are your five topics. Choose one. Discuss, and they're pretty easy. Discuss the theme of exile in The Wanderer and at least one other Old English work. Okay? Or two. Discuss the importance of the hall and all it stands for in Old English literature using such works as The Wanderer, Beowulf, and one other work. Obviously, that means you better have some quotes from The Wanderer and Beowulf. <laughs> okay. Discuss the use of Christianity or allusions to the Christian story in The Dream of the Root. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? Because it's all about the cross of Christ speaking. And two other Old English works. Again, I don't care which ones. Ones that we've read, though. Okay? Just take your pick. Uh, four, discuss J.R.R. Tolkien's comment in the essay. And you've got the essay if you want to find the exact thing. That all Old English literature is ultimately about the death of man and all his works. Referring to three or more works of Old English literature. So that one, obviously, you've got three sources. If you quote from Tolkien, include Tolkien in your works cited page. 
right? And then number five, which is kind of related to a couple of others, discuss the theme of life, human existence, as a journey slash pilgrimage from a place of mutability here to a place of permanence, heaven, in bead, and at least two other sources. Right? So, 750 to 1,000 words. All right, let's pick up where we left off. And where we left off should have been somewhere right around 2355. Okay? Go back to just a second, actually, 2345. So, where we left off was Beowulf ordered his men, whoever, his smith, to make a shield. Why? He's going to go fight the dragon. And we're told, 2347, he did not dread that attack, nor did he worry much about the dragon's warfare, his strength or valor, that is the dragon's strength or valor, because he had survived many battles, barely escaping alive in the crash of war, after he had cleansed triumphant hero of the Hall of Hrothgar, Grendel. Notice what the poet's doing there. Beowulf's not afraid to fight the dragon because after he killed Grendel, Beowulf survived a whole bunch of battles. So what is the narrator telling us? Beowulf's a hero. He's got this. Beowulf's a hero. He's got this. He survived all these other battles before. What's the implication? He'll survive this one too. Okay? He's a monster killer. He's not a monster being killed by. Okay? So, the speaker then goes back to an event that's been alluded to previously. He elects Frisian Raid. Right after... Wealthiel gives Beowulf the neck ring. The poet says, oh, and by the way, Helak was wearing that neck ring on his last battle, hmm. and it's going to get stolen. That's the first reference to it. Okay? So now we get this one. It was not the least of hand-to-hand -hand combats when Helak was slain in the chaos of battle. The king of the Geats, the lord of his people, in the land of the Frisians, the son of Hrethel, died sword-drunk, beaten by blades. Sword drunk probably implies he drank a lot of swords. <laughs> kind of like, you know, Caesar with the mob. He got stuck by a lot of swords. Okay? And yet, Beowulf escaped from there through his own strength. Took a long swim. And I posted today, because apparently I'd forgotten to do it before, I posted today to the content section of D2L several files. One of those is a map of the location for Beowulf. Okay? If we were to put a map up here of Northern Europe, Frisia is over here, kind of today what's like the Netherlands. Okay? Where is the land of the Geats? Southern Sweden. So when it says he took a long swim, that's from Frisia, the land of the Frisians. Okay, it's the northern coast of Europe. You got Denmark sticking up like a sore thumb right here. Frisia is over here. He took a long swim, means around Denmark to the Baltic. Long swim. Okay. And he had in his arms the battle armor of 30 men. Now, Fred Robinson, who I've referred to before, Fred Robinson wanted to suggest, and he actually interprets the passage where it says Beowulf rode, okay, um, that he was in a boat. But it's not rode. It's swim. He swam. Because to put him in a boat with 30 coats of armor, yeah, well, anybody could do that. Okay, maybe not a fighter. But any warrior worth a spit could row a boat. He swims with 30 suits of armor. So how does he swim with this arm? Yeah. He dog paddles. 
like several hundred miles. Why does the poet do this? He's, he's superhuman. He's not, he's not like us again. Just look at his name. <laughs> what should his name begin with, according to Germanic fashion? Look at these names. Look at Daddy's name. These names all begin with H. Why? Daddy's name begins with H. These names both begin with O. Why? Daddy's name begins with O. These names both begin with E. They're vowels. All vowels alliterate. What's his daddy's name? Edge they out. His name should begin with what? A vowel. <laughs> it might be Eowulf, or Eowulf, or Oowulf, or Oowulf, or... But it should be a vowel. The fact that his name doesn't begin with alliteration with his father's name, that is a kind of a, I think at least, a lot of people don't think this. I think they're crazy. It's a textual clue that Beowulf is different. He's not an ordinary, everyday human. Or if he is, he's a different kind of human. I think I mentioned the other day in this class, the Book of Judges. He's kind of like maybe one of those judges, so to speak. Possibly. So, he escapes. Okay. Think of the Germanic fourfold ethic. Duty to first, Lord, second, duty to kin, third, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin. And I think I've talked about it here how in in kind of the quintessential <laughs> fashion, you know, if your Lord dies in battle, you should die with him. It doesn't mean if you win, you kill yourself. I mean, if your Lord dies in battle and you beat the other guys, you don't have to sacrifice yourselves because your Lord died. Okay? So, Beowulf, you know, lives. His Lord dies, but apparently Beowulf's the only one who lives. But we get told, by no means did the Hetwara need to exult in that fight, that is, their tribe fighting alongside with the Frisians against the Geats, when they marched on foot to him. Few came back from that brave soldier. That's Lytotes. How few? Zero. Beowulf killed them all. And I alone am escaped to tell thee. No. So, he crossed the vast sea, wretched, solitary by himself, returned to his people. And Hig said, Beowulf, become king. You be the king of the people. Why? Because her son, Hardred, was a minor at this time. Probably meaning 8 to 12, something like that. Not old enough to really take up the kingship. Maybe 8 to 15, okay, or younger. And Beowulf said no. Yet he, 2377, he upheld him in the folk with friendly counsel. Okay. Doesn't mean he literally holds him up like, you know, what if, what's his name with Simba, you know. He's, it means what? He's standing behind him flexing. So everybody sees, okay, there's the little boy, and there's Beowulf. <laughs> Don't mess with the little boy. In him we're told what all this is about. Wretched exiles, the sons of Othera, Aenmund and Aenils. By the way, notice, you know, little exam hint there. Wretched exiles. They what? They, they come and seek out Hardred. Wretched exiles, the sons of Othera, sought him out across the seas. Who's the him? Not Beowulf. They're seeking out Hardred. Why? Hardred's king. So they come seeking a refuge. Where in the past, previously in the poem, have we seen or heard about someone who sought refuge at some place else as an exile? Beowulf. 
father. Okay. Hrothgar gave him refuge. He paid off his debt because of the stealing of the Hedeborn man. So these two exiles come over here. They seek help from Hardrick. Why are they exiles? They had rebelled against the Shilving's ruler. And your gloss tells you, Onola. Right? Onola, uh, son of Onyadal. Otura, this one, had succeeded his father, Onyadal, but after his death, his brother, Onola, um, Otura had succeeded his father, but after his death, his brother, Onola apparently seized the throne and drove the two brothers exile. That is, he died. Notice, I'm suggesting he didn't maybe just die of natural causes. Okay. He dies. Who should become king? One of his sons. Eldest son. When you look at charts like this, the person farthest most to the left, that's always the eldest. Okay. Eldest son should have become king. But younger brother, and where are we? Uh, Hamlet, right? King Hamlet Sr., Claudius, Hamlet Jr., Mufasa, Scar, Simba. It works, man. <laughs> Lion King really, really, really works in terms of rewriting our Hamlet. So, there are some sources that suggest totally different story, right? I mean, because it's about this group it's not the Beowulf story. Other stories suggest Onla kills his brother, takes the kingship. There's the Hamlet thing. Okay? So these two flee. Why? They rebel against his kingship. But look what the poet says. They had rebelled against the Shilving's ruler, 2382 now. The best of all the sea kings who dispensed treasure in the Swedish lands, a famous king. That is the speaker of the poem saying what about Onola? Best king the Swedes ever had. Better than Onyantel, who's famous, by the way. Shows up in Old Norse sources. That cost him his life. Him who? Hardrick. What cost him his life? He gave refuge to these two. How did it cost him his life? Well, look at the next line. For his hospitality, he took a mortal hurt with the stroke of a sword, that son of Helak. And the son of Anyantiao, Onola, afterwards went to seek out his home. What does the afterwards mean? After he killed Hardrick. So, these two rebel against their uncle slash king. So much for duty to one's lord, but so much to duty to one's kin. <laughs> they rebel, they flee. Onla chases them, okay, and he kills Hardrick. Fourfold Germanic epic, what now kicks in? Beowulf has to do what? Avenge Onola. When does he have to avenge him? Is there a time frame? Does the fourfold dramatic ethic say, okay, the clock's going to clean and you've got 24 hours? No, it does <laughs> not literally. But usually in the literature, that vengeance, it's swift. <laughs> it's quick. After all, she operates in perfect Anglo-Saxon fashion. She operates according perfectly to Anglo-Saxon law. How long before Grindel's mother executes vengeance for the death of Grindel? The very next night. She doesn't wait. And she is, kind of morally we could say, in the right. Why? Beowulf didn't have a beef with Grindel. Grindel's beef was with whom? Hrothgar. Beowulf insinuates himself. Here's where she kind of does wrong. Does she kill Beowulf? No. 
she kills an old guy. <laughs> Asher is an old guy. I mean, Hrothgar says, he was with me from the beginning. And now Hrothgar is 82 at least. Okay. So, Onla kills Beowulf's king. And we're told. And then he, afterwards, he went to seek out his throne. So after he kills him, he goes back home. Why doesn't Beowulf stop him? Can, is, is Onla stronger than Beowulf? Is he more powerful than Beowulf? Was Beowulf on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> Once Hardred lay dead, that is, he afterwards went to seek out his home. Once Hardred lay dead. And then the Old English reads... 2384, uh, 87 or so. 2389. Um, so then Hardred lay, after Hardred lay, or once Hardred lay, let Thona Bregostol, let that throne Beowulf Healden. He let Beowulf Healden to hold, rule, possess that throne. That throne. What does the verb let mean? What's another word we use, use for that? Allowed. Okay. Think Latin. Permitted. Or gave permission to. What do both of those imply? He chose to allow it. Okay. What else? If I allow you to do something, what does that say about the power relationship between me and you? You have power over me. It means I have the power. He allowed Beowulf to hold the throne. That implies then what else? Well, the exact opposite. He could have not allowed Beowulf to hold the throne. Why is this significant? This is Beowulf we're talking about. This isn't some peon. Mightiest man in the world. Monster killer. And he's letting some Swede tell him what to do? Yeah. That's exactly the point. It doesn't fit. It, it's like a... Uh, the record just skipped. Okay. There's a problem with that image. Or maybe I'm just too stupid and simple enough and take things too literally to not understand the great significance. Because when I raised this issue on ANSACS, which is the Anglo International Anglo-Saxon Listserv for discussion Anglo-Saxon scholarly stuff, back in the mid-90s, you would think I'd said Beowulf was Gaywolf. You know, that story I talked about the other day. Because people are like, what the hell are you suggesting? And I'm like, first of all, one, I'm not suggesting. Two, I'm asking. <laughs> but what does this suggest about Beowulf? It does suggest that he is somehow inferior to Onola. What well, doesn't fit everything else that's come in the previous 2,388 lines? If Beowulf wants something, what happens? He gets it. He gets it. I mean, after all, he slew five, and then an entire race of giants, we were told. And this guy... Let him have the throne? Because let implies what else? Not only allowed, not only gave permission, Beowulf kind of becomes what in that sense? Puppet ruler? Now here was the argument everybody else immediately then jumped to when I first raised this. But... Hold that thought for just a moment because we have to finish this little passage. He let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the gates 
fact was God kinning. The exact same line we heard about Shield Shelly. There's one other place where we hear fact was God kinning. It's used three times. The other place, it's actual second usage in the poem, it's prefixed with ak. But. And that's after Beowulf kills Grendel. And they follow the muddy path, the bloody path to Grendel's mirror. And they look at it. And then they start riding back to Herod. And the men start singing Beowulf's praises. And it's kind of like they remember themselves. They go, yeah, but Hrothgar's a good king too. <laughs> Ach, fact was called kidding. But he was a good king, okay? Here, who is the fact was gold kidding about? Is it Beowulf? Or is it Onola? Because most scholars, yeah, I shouldn't say most, many scholars, and I'm definitely in this camp, we think it refers to Onola, not Beowulf. Then fit 34. And this is why everybody, to kind of shoot down my supposition, um, kind of come back to. In later days, he did not forget that prince's fall. How long is in later days? <laughs> is that two days? Is that three days? Because later days sounds like a long passage. So, after a while, Beowulf remembered his prince's, Hardred's, death. Why? Fourfold Germanic ethics still in play here. And he did what? He befriended Aegils. Why? Well, who is Aegils now? He's dead. He's dead. He's still alive. He's still king. Beowulf befriends him. Why? He starts to want to kill him. He befriended Aegils, the wretched exile. Across the open sea, he gave support to the son of Otra with warriors and weapons. Notice, Beowulf supplied men and materiel to Aegils to defeat his uncle. Who has the greatest claim to vengeance? against Onola. Beowulf or Aegils? Aegils. Why? Okay. He possibly killed his father. He definitely killed his brother. And rightful king. Okay. Cousin. Yeah, blood relation. That's pretty strong. Not as strong as brother. King. Yeah. Aegils has the greater claim. <laughs> Does that mean, you know, go, you walk around and go, let's see, who's got the greater claim to vengeance? Does, no, but, so, he helps, and Aegils defeats Onola. Okay. We're going to get to West uh, Wheelof and all those folks later. And so the son of Edgedale had survived every struggle. So that whole long passage is for what purpose? It's to entwine Beowulf and the Geats with the Swedes. It's to get, to get those two groups kind of messed up, kind of muddied up. Why? Because of what's going to happen after the dragon. The poet is, is pulling that thread along. So, what does Beowulf do? He takes his nice new shield, and he chooses his hand-picked men. A dozen of them were told, 2402, to seek out the dragon. He knew now how the feud arose. In other words, word has reached him why the dragon woke up. Who leads them? Title of Michael Crichton's novel, The Thirteenth Warrior. The Thirteenth, who's the Thirteenth Man? It's Beowulf and 12 and one more. The guy who stole the cup. You think he willingly goes or you think he has a sword sitting in his back going, show me. He leads them. He's not a warrior. He leads them. 
We're told the sad-minded captive, wretched and despised, he led the way to that plain. He went against his will. It's pretty clear he doesn't want to be there. To the underground cave. And there's the giant, uh, the monster, excuse me, 2412, um, 13, a monstrous guardian, eager for combat, kept his gold treasures ancient under the mound. So, they make their way to the cape, the headland overlooking the sea. There's the big burial mound. And what happens? Bale pulls the sword out and runs, you know, a la 300, you know, 300 against the Mopalites. No, what'd you do? Sit he down. sits down. Why? Because his friend's the best. Why else? The baby died. Probably. Keep going. How old is he? I think it's because he's 92 at least. And he's like, damn, my knees are Take a rest here, boys. The battle hardened king sat down on the cape, then wished good health to his hearth companions, the gold friend of the gates. And we could go all, you know, Princess Bride and have fun storming the castle, boys. But we're told his heart was grieving, restless, ripe for death. He's ready to die. What did Hrothgar say at the conclusion of his homily? Be ready. You don't know when it's coming. Sword, spear, old age, fire, flood, sword, spear, old age. He kind of repeats certain things. And we're told the doom was immeasurably near that was coming to meet that old man, seek his soul's treasure, split asunder his life and body. Who is saying that? That's the speaker of the poem. That's not Beowulf. And what has the speaker of the poem just told us when we still have 700 lines to go? He's going to die. Whatever happened to suspense? <coughs> Spoiler, alert. Spoiler alert. Suspense doesn't work in Anglo-Saxon literature the way it does for us today. Okay? So, what does Beowulf do? In my youth, I survived many storms of battle. It's almost the exact same thing he says when he arrives at Hera. But that was at least 50 years ago. I still remember them all. I was seven years old when the Prince of Treasures, friend to his people, took me from my father. Who's he talking about? He's not talking about Hrothgar. He's talking about Hrebel. Took me from my father. Where was he when he was with his father? At Hrothgar's. So, I knew him being but a boy. Is that up until the age of seven? So now we have seven plus 50 plus 12. 62, 69? When Beowulf arrives at Grindel's? At 50? 119? Plus whatever intervening period? Between going back and becoming king? So, why did he go live with Hrebel? What is Hrebel to him? Grandfather. And Hrebel's a, a famous character, by the way, also. Like Anyanthal was, like Halfdane was for the Geats. Notice, they're all the same generation, by the way. You've got Halfdane, you've got Anyanthal, you've got Hrebel. Okay? So, and what does he do? Okay, he's getting ready. Think of this as a sporting match. He's getting ready for what? This is the biggest match of his life. I mean, this is the granddaddy of them all. What do sports psychologists tell you to do? Whether it's sports, you're getting ready for a big battle, you're in the military, do you get ready to take on, you know, the enemy of Fallujah by thinking... No, you visualize success, achievement, gold ring. And he tells a story about his grandfather and two of his uncles. And what's the story about? 
Uncle Hefkin accidentally killed Uncle Harold. Oops. <laughs> Germanic ethic. Kin slaying is the worst thing you could do. Rothgar, who's he have sitting at his feet? Uthris. And Beowulf labels a kinslayer. So, Harbald and Hathkin, my own Helak. For the eldest, undeservedly, and he tells the story of how Hathkin killed Harbald. And we talked before about that name and this name are probably related to the Old Norse Balder in Hoother. Hoother kills Balder. And what does that start? Ragnarok. And what's Ragnarok? The end of the world. <laughs> Beowulf is relating this story just before his fight with the dragon. Why? Because I think the poet is telling us something. For Beowulf and his people, his fight with the dragon is kind of their Ragnarok. <coughs> Little historical tidbit. After six, seven hundred, definitely eight hundred, there are no Geats. The Geats are a historical tribe. We know they really lived, but at some point they were no more. <laughs> and the poet is kind of giving us why they were no more. It's their own Ragnarok. All right? So, what happens? Haskin kills Haribold accidentally. Germanic ethic says what? He's either got to pay Weregild, or he becomes outcast, not exiled. Outcast, and he, according to vengeance, must be killed. How does the family do that? How does dad seek vengeance for the death of his son from his other son? Here, son, let me write you a check. Now give me it back. That doesn't work. Weirdgill doesn't work. How about, okay, son, you killed your eldest brother. Sorry, got to kill you. Why doesn't that work? Because then he becomes a kid slayer. Rock. Meet hard place. <laughs> Catch, meet 22. <laughs> he is literally damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Why does the poet put that in? Notice my terminology, poet. Because I think the poet is saying, this doesn't work. This whole fourfold Germanic ethic, it doesn't work. This is ultimately what you get to. What happens? It's like water in a drain. Eventually, in with who left? No one. And what do we end the poem with? Who's left? The gates are going to be wiped out, the poet's going to tell us. Okay? So, what happens to Hravel? Beowulf says he dies of a broken heart. Why? Because he can't do anything. He can't get vengeance for his son. That's kind of like the, the priest, Koifi, and the other priest telling Koifi and King Edwin, yeah, you know, we've been practicing this religion for a long while, and it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> Maybe we need another story. Okay? So... Beowulf says, 2464, he could not in any way make amends for the feud with his murderer. Right? The feud is tied in centrally with that Germanic ethic. And the Beowulf poet seems to be saying, a feud mentality does not work. We need to come up with another way. So, with the sorrow which oppressed him too sorely, 2468, he gave up man's joys, chose God's light. And your gloss tells you, duh, he died. But the poet says, 
He chose God's light. I once had a graduate student say, does that mean he killed himself? No. It means what? If you take that kind of literally. This here, this doesn't work. That maybe does. Is it pagan Germanic thought? No. No. Not at all. And he left to his children his land and strongholds as a blessed man does, which is what Shield Sheving did to his children, which is what Hrothgar supposedly will do to his children, which is what Beowulf should do to his... Oh, sorry. Beowulf doesn't have any children. Why? Beowulf, damn told <laughs> I'll never forget that till the day I die. It'll probably be the last thing on my lips, you know. <laughs> and then we're told, and then there was strife between the Swedes and the Geats. Why? Why would suddenly strife wake up between them? Because they were at peace before this, or relatively at peace, at least not in open warfare. Here's why. Because after Hrevel died, until the sons of Anyanthel were bold and were like one of no peace over the sea, but around the Hill of Sorrows they carried out a terrible and devious campaign. My friends and kinsmen got revenge for those feuds and such. Okay? The battle was fatal for Hathkin. Hathkin died in that battle. Well, he doesn't tell us yet. He's going to tell us shortly. Okay, so what's so big about this? Why does it really happen? The implication is it's not the Swedes that started. Hathkin attacks the Swedes. And what does he do? The poet says he deprives Onion Thou's wife of her gold. Now, you can read that literally. It means he takes her gold. Or you can be dirty minded like I am and say he took her treasure, <laughs> he raped her. Yeah, probably would not make Onion Thou or his sons all that happy to have their mother raped. So, Hathkin dies. Probably rightfully. <laughs> so Beowulf goes on and says, I'm skipping the stuff about Eother and such. Beowulf says, I paid in battle for the precious treasures he gave me, that is, Helak gave me, as was granted to me with a gleaming sword, he gave me land, a joyous home, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, skipping a bit, go to 2506. Excuse me, 2501. He says, I'll wage war while the sword endures, which before and since has served me well. Since I slew Day Raven, Dawn, the raven of the day, the harbinger, the announcer of the day, kind of means Dawn, that's what the guy's name means, champion of the Hugas, with my bare hands in front of the whole enemy. Well, who's Day Raven, and why is he significant? He's the one who killed Helak. He's the champion of the Hugas, and Beowulf says, "This is where are we? We're back at the Frisian raid. We left this battle, the Swedes and the Geats, aside for a moment, and we're back with the Frisian raid. He keeps coming back to this. It's got to be significant to the Pope for some reason. Why? Why did the Frisians and the Geats go to war? Because Helak opened, began, started a feud. His name, by the way, Helak, sometimes it's pronounced Hijalak. If you take the components as meaning something, some of us like to do that. Some scholars don't like to do that. It means lack thought or mind or modern American colloquial English, dummy. <laughs> He's big and dumb. <laughs> he starts this thing and he gets killed in it. Right? But Beowulf does what? He kills the champion of the Hugas. How? He says, I'm going to fight with this sword of mine, because it's always, it's always done me well. This sword has done him well against monsters. Not brittle. But sea monsters? Yeah, slices and dices. Giants and stuff? Yeah. 
any human Beowulf kills, and he's the only one named, by the way, how does he kill him? Bare hands. With his bare hands. And he doesn't kill him with his bare hands, beating him down. He squeezes him to death. So what's that tell us about Beowulf? He's jacked. Okay, he's jacked. <laughs> what else? I mean, strength of 30 men in each hand grip. What do we, you know, what's the phrase we use? You come up to somebody you haven't seen for a while, you give them a big bear hug. Bear hug. <laughs> Killed him. Maybe it is. Okay, well, the untold story. <laughs> a bear hug, which would make Beowulf like what? A bear. A bear. Well, Beowulf, Beo, B, Wolf. What's the wolf of bees? A blue. Or Winnie the Pooh. With his honey and his tumbly. Okay? Bear. Which means it's a little indication. Again, it's one of those little kind of textual clues, if you want. Indicating what to us about Beowulf. So he's not like man. everybody else. He's not like every other man. In which he's kind of Monstrous. I mean, do you really want somebody like this in your society walking around? Do you really want X Men walking around in your society or the Avengers? Not, you know, Tony Stark. Do you really want somebody like the witch? <laughs> no, we don't want those people. Okay? So. Beowulf then says to his men, again, line 2510, he speaks boasting words for the last time. I've survived many battles in my youth. And they're going, yeah, Beowulf, we know that. I mean, look, the time's I mean, Come on, kill the dragon. I will yet, an old folk guardian, seek out a feud and do a glorious deed. If only that evildoer, channeling his inner George Bush, those evildoers, <laughs> will come out to me from this earth hall. What's he saying? I ain't going in there. <laughs> I'm not that stupid. I may be old, but I'm not senile. <laughs> He's got to get the dragon to come out. Why? Kind of, you know, not my turf, not his turf, but neutral territory, so to speak. He says, and I wouldn't use a sword if I knew any other way to kill him. Like I did with Grendel. I will not flee a single foot, 2525, but for us it shall be at the wall as weird decrees, the ruler of every man. Weird. Not fate. What will be, will be. Whatever happens, that's what's supposed to happen. Okay? My mind is firm. I will forego boasting against this flying foe, even though he is kind of boasting. So he tells the men, you guys wait here. Why? This is not your path. My way is not your way, you know, going all zen on them. And it's only proper for me. So he gets his shield, and he goes up. He trusted in his own strength. And we're told, he saw then by the wall, 25, 42 or so, he saw stone arches standing. I put that on the board the other day. The word is stan boga. Why is that significant? Who invented the arch? The Romans. Anglo-Saxons didn't build arches. Go to Stonehenge. What's it look like? It does not look like a bunch of rocks that look like this. There are rocks that look like that. Why? You have, have, have to have a little basic understanding of geometry and physics. And Anglo-Saxons and the Celts before them, no understanding of geometry and physics. Okay? And some understanding of physics, because they had to get those big heavy rocks up here by leverage. 
So, he goes up, he stands at the entrance, and what does he do? We're told, enraged, 25, 50 and following, a, let a word burst forth from his breast, he shouted starkly. What's he shout? Yeah, wake up. Hey. yoo -hoo, Mr. Dragon. <laughs> you know. Whatever he says, we're told, inside the dragon recognized the voice of a man. Now, recognize, and the old English word pretty much is that, means what? If you recognize something, you what? You remember it. You understand it. It, it means something. And it's not like the dragon here. Blah, blah, blah. Right? He hears what? I don't know. Hey, you dirty, rotten, legless lizard, son of a slimy... <laughs> And all the Beowulf films, by the way, do what with the dragon? Almost all of them. The dragon becomes what? Either Beowulf's son or Hrothgar's son with a witch of some sort. You know, Angelina Jolie with the tail and all that kind of <laughs> complete and utter nonsense. <laughs> so, the dragon comes out. Why? You called me a what? You said what? And Beowulf draws his sword. He stands stout hearted behind his shield. And we're going to skip this part or go through it quickly. They kind of have three battles. The dragon comes. Beowulf doesn't do that well. He tries to strike the dragon. The dragon comes again. Beowulf's not doing very well. And what happens with one of his men? Wheelof runs up to do what? Help. How? Does he have a better shield? What do coaches do at halftime when you're down? Pep talk. Pep talk. What's the pep talk he delivers to Beowulf? It's pretty much, you're Beowulf! <laughs> you said you wouldn't step back a single foot, and you have. Come on! You're Beowulf, you're a monster killer. And Beowulf's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. And the dragon, you know. <laughs> so, he encourages Beowulf, and Beowulf goes for what kind of shot? Kill shot. I mean, baseball metaphor. He's standing at the plate, and what's he thinking? Bases are loaded. Grand slam. This sucker's going out of the park. It's going out of town. Right? So where's he going to hit the dragon? You really want to kill a snake, where do you hit it? Tail? Head. head. You go for the head. What's the problem with that? You're out, you're mowing your yard, cleaning, raking, whatever, and you see a snake and you hear a... That's a rattlesnake. You see a little snake with stripes on its back. That's a garter snake. Leave it alone. It's not going to hurt you. Right? But you hear that... That's a rattlesnake. You go, oh, nice little snakey, and reach down for its neck. Uh-uh, because you're dead. <laughs> but that's what Beowulf does, because he doesn't have a shovel. Because <laughs> he would need a really big shovel for this snake. So he swings at the head. And what happens? Seemingly, every time he uses a sword... But this time, his sword, which has a name, Nyling, Son of Nails. Now, that's a pretty awesome name for a sword. Okay? Shatters. And Bill's like, damn, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> but what does Wheeloff do? We're told, Wheeloff, you know, he kind of puts two and two, he's not a dummy, he, he can add. He goes a little lower down, and he stabs the dragon where? Stomach? Where's a dragon's pilot light for the fire? Is it the heart? Is it the throat? We don't know. We don't know dragon anatomy. We, you can't take a course in Draca Anatomos, you know. So he strikes it, and the poet says he does what? He puts out its fire. So I'm not joking when I talk about it's pilot light, you know. 
He puts out the fire. And what does Beowulf do? He reaches down, probably into his boot, into his laced leggings, and pulls out his little sex. S-E-A-X. And does what to the dragon? We're told he cuts it in the middle. Now, I'm one who believes that what that means is he cuts it in two. He goes, like he's opening the can. Only this can is, I don't know, that big around. Because how long is this dragon? And by the way, it is described as legless. Some dragons had legs and wings. This dragon has wings and no legs. So think a really long snake with wings. We're told it's a hundred paces. So is a pace one, two, three, like that, or like that? Because if it's like that, that's about three feet. You want to be wrong? Be old, you know what, snake. <laughs> Flesh with wings and fire. Okay? So he kills it. And let me go back to Wheelof for a moment. Who's Wheelof? He's one of Beowulf's handpicked 12 men. But the poet gives us a little bit of background. Wheelof's father was a man named Weston. <coughs> Weston was a hired gun, so to speak, for Ottawa. Weston was the one responsible for the death of Anion, Anmund. Remember, these two come over here. Hardred gives the men a material. They go and attack Onala. Anmund is killed. Anil flees. He goes back. Beowulf then gives him help, etc. later. So, Weston killed Anmund. Well, what do you do when you kill an enemy? You take their stuff. You take their armor, you take their swords, whatever weapons they have. So he does that, and then if you're a good warrior in Thane, what do you do with the armor, weaponry, etc. you've stolen from your opponent? You give it to your lord. And if your lord is a good lord, what does he do? No, 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 you keep it. He gives it back to you. So, Anmund's weapons and armor are given by Westan to Onala. Onala gives them back to Westan. Westan dies. And they become Wheelos. Ring any bells about a story embedded within the bigger story? When Beowulf comes back to the land of the Geats, Emma just got it, what does he do? He tells Helak a story. What's the story about? Hrothgar's daughter Freyru, who's going to marry Ingild, son of Froda. And what's going to happen? There will be a Dane who will go with her, who's going to be decked out in some old dead Heatherbard warrior's armor. And some old not dead Heatherbard warrior is going to tell the dead Heatherbard warrior's son, he's wearing your daddy's armor. You're going to let him do that? Get him. <laughs> Why is this significant? Cut to the short, Beowulf dies. Not everything goes up. Not everybody else. Beowulf dies. Who becomes king after him? Wheelof. Why? Because Beowulf will tell him, skip a bit, let's see here, because we're going to come back for a moment to Wheelof's words to his men. Uh, Beowulf will say, line 28, 13. You are the last survivor of our lineage, the Waymondings. That's really the only time in the poem we're told about the Waymondings. And what's Beowulf said? You and I are related. Why? Because probably Weston and Edgedale are somehow related. Cousins, I guess. That's the best we can guess. Okay? So... He's going to become king. Problem? He's going to become king. Who's king of the Swedes? What happens to the feud? It just keeps on a rolling. 
And who does Wheeloff not have protecting the throne? Bill. He doesn't have the jacked up armor. <laughs> and so, the messenger is going to tell us all hell's about to break loose. Now let's go back for a moment. So, before Wheeloff intervenes, what does he say to Beowulf's men? Come on, guys. Let's go help them. And what do they do? Have fun storming the castle or have fun fighting the dragon. Uh, no, he told us, told us not to. In other words, they could make what claim? We're following orders. Hey, we're following the orders of our Lord. Duty to one's Lord, you know. That's the biggie. We're following that. So Wheeloff intervenes. He helps Beowulf, but not enough. And Beowulf is bit where by the dragon? He goes for the head. He fails. The dragon bites him on the neck. There is a source. Uh, I had written it down, actually, and forgotten it totally. There is a source from the Middle Ages that talks about wounds to the neck. Wounds to the neck are always indicative of the sin of pride. Right? Now, I don't know that that's what the Beowulf poet is trying to convey. He could have been a little prideful by going for the head. He, he could have tried, you know, cutting it in two lower down because it would have died shortly. Anyways, he gets bit on the neck. And what happens? Wheeloff, we're told, is commanded by Beowulf. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Page 2715. Yeah, back up. 2712 or 11. When the wound which the earth dragon had worked on him began to burn and swell, he soon realized that in his breast was an evil force, a poison welling. Then the nobleman went, still wise in thought, so that he sat on a seat by the wall. Okay. So we have the mound. Big barrel. It has an arched opening. And outside the arched opening, there's a bench. <laughs> Looking out over the sea for the sunset, so that the dragon could come out at night with a beer and cigar, <laughs> enjoy the afternoon sunset. Make an evening of it. Why is there a sea outside a burial mound? I could be completely wrong. I think it's something the poet probably actually saw, and he's thinking, "Well, there is one," you know. Why else would there? It doesn't make any sense. Why, when when Beowulf went in Grendel's mother's hall, underground cave, you know, he kills her, and then what does he see? We're told he kind of looks around, and what does he see? He sees a fire and things hanging on the wall. Well, look, there's a big giant sword, which is what he uses to kill her. What's that kind of description kind of tell us? She's domestic. She's got a little fire. She's got decorations. Okay, she's kind of martial. I mean, like dungeony decorations, you know, okay? Into a little S&M and weird stuff, okay? So now, oh, and I completely, you know, unless you saw it in, you know, one of the lectures online, where's the sword come from? Now, the text tells us it's the old work of giants. After Beowulf kills Grendel, God damn, giants are so <laughs> after Beowulf kills Grendel, and the men are telling stories of Beowulf as they ride back to Herod from the mirror. Right? What's one of the stories they tell? Sigamund and the dragon. How does Sigmund kill the dragon? This is the or earliest, by the way, and this is the earliest version of that Germanic tale in existence. That becomes Siegfried in um, Wagner's Got the Dharma Room. Uh, the Ring Cycle, not the Got the Dharma Room. Right? Well, what does Sigmund do? 
He digs a trench, he gets in the trench, and Fafnir, the dragon, crawls over him and thrusts his sword up and kills the dragon. Why does he want to kill the dragon? Because Regan the dwarf told him, if you drink the dragon's blood, bring the, he wants him to bring the dragon's blood to him, but if you drink the dragon's blood, you'll understand the speech of all living things. And he drinks the blood, and he understands the birds, and the cows, and you know, etc. Okay? But we're told in that tale that when he strikes the dragon, he sticks the sword into the wall of the, you know, the cave-like thing that he's made. And then Beowulf goes down into Grendel's mother's hall, and where does he find the sword? Lo and behold, foretold, hanging on or in the wall. Is it the same sword? It's a question I've always wondered. I've never seen anything that's ever addressed that. Okay? So, Beowulf dies, or just before he dies, he asks Wheelof, commands Wheelof, to do some things. So he sits there on the seat, and he looks on the work of giants. What's the work of giants? The barrow. He thinks that nobody human could have made this. And Roth, um, Wheelof gets there, and we're told he bathes Beowulf with water. Then with his hands, the thane immeasurably good, 2720, bathed with water his beloved lord, the great, great prince, spattered with gore, unstraps his helmet. So he washes his head off. Symbolic, by the way. First time. And Beowulf speaks. He knows he's almost dead. And says, Now I should wish to give my war gear to my son. If there had been such. What does that mean? It's pretty clear, right? I have no son. Famous Late 19th, early 20th century critic, however, reads five lines at the very end of the poem to suggest Beowulf had a wife and possibly did have a son. Hello? Anyways, I held this people 50 winters. So I ruled 50 years. We've already been told that. There was no folk king, not any of the neighboring tribes, who dared to face me with hostile forces or threaten attack. Sounds kind of like what? Hrothgar's homily about the guy who rules for 50 years and didn't have any enemies. So Beowulf says, okay, I fit the model. The decrees of fate I awaited on earth. The word isn't fate, it's weird. The decrees of what will be, will be, I awaited on earth. Beowulf is saying, I was not a proactive president. I was a reactive president. He did not do what the first fat was good king did. What did Shield Sheving do? He terrorized everybody in the surrounding area. He deprived them of their need benches. Beowulf says, nope, I just stayed here. I sought no intrigues, didn't get involved, nor swore many false or wrongful oaths. He's not saying, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm just human. I did some. No, that's Lytotes. He didn't swear any false or wrongful oaths. The intrigues, by the way, language, is implying alliances. I didn't make any alliances as king. What does he tell Hrothgar before he becomes king? Hey, if your son, your son needs any problems, just pick up the phone and I'll come at the head of a thousand warriors. As king, he said, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> Why? This is my kingdom. Right here. These boundaries. Don't mess with me. You don't, you don't bother me. I won't bother you. How different is that from S.H.I.E.L.D. or Hrothgar? How is it Hrothgar can build the greatest hall the world has ever seen? Everyone around him is terrified. Everybody around him is terrified. He scares them, you know what? And they pay tribute and they help him construct it. Beowulf, he rules what he has when he becomes king and doesn't expand. 
about Beowulf were never told that was God kinning, unless that third that was God kinning refers to him and not to Onela. Okay, so he says because of all that, I may have joy, though thick, though sick with mortal wounds. I can have joy even though I'm dying, because the ruler of men need not reproach me with the murder of kinsmen. When my life quits my body. Now, the word is actually murder, I'm pretty sure. 2742. Yeah. Murder death is what it actually says. Um, so he's saying, you know, I wasn't like Haramode. But he could also be implying, I'm not saying that it is saying this, I'm saying it's possible. I wasn't responsible for the death of my men in war. Why? What do you have for 50 years? Peace. The 12 men he chooses to come with him to fight the dragon, with they are, we are told they are 12 hand-picked. They are the best men he has. And yet 11 of them turn out to be what? Cowards. Cowards. Well, okay, let's look at it from the, their perspective. How many battles have they fought? None. Yeah, none. And he's asking them to fight what? A dragon. A dragon. Hello. No. <laughs> All right. So, he tells uh, Wheeloff, Go look under the horde, now that the worm lies dead, and bring some out so I can see what I want for my people. Notice he doesn't say, bring it all out to me so I can go, mine, you know, and die. <laughs> no, what I've won for my people, because he says, 2750, for that great wealth, I give up my life and lordship. Not for himself. It's for his people. He's saying, I sacrificed my life and my lordship so my people can have all this. It'll be a benefit to them. So, Wheelof goes in and he just brings out armfuls and armfuls of stuff. Doesn't bring out all of it because there's a lot there. Okay. He comes back, and we get a description of what he finds. He comes back out. But we, uh, we do find out the dragon has a light, has a fire in his hall, too. He's a domestic dragon. Okay? With a garden bitch. With a garden bitch. So he comes back out. He sees Beowulf, weakened by wounds. And he wakes him again. He sprinkles water on him. He revives him. And Beowulf thanks God for all these treasures. The king of glory that I was able to acquire such wealth for my people before my death day. Why? Because he says, these will attend to the needs of my people. He's saying, this will help everybody. So now he asks Wheelof, just before he dies, build a big old monument to me. Okay, that's a little prideful. You got to admit. <laughs> okay. And he takes from his neck a golden circlet. Notice, it's not from his head. It's not a crown. It's like an Irish torque. T-O-R-C. He removes it. This is the symbol of kingship. And he puts it around Wheelof's neck. That means from that moment on, Wheelof's king. If anybody wants to argue with him, they're arguing with the king. And he says, his famous lines, you are the last survivor of our lineage. The Mohicans. So, sorry, different story. It's almost exactly the same, by the way. It's almost the exact same lines that Chingachgook says to uh, Neddy Bumpo in the novel The Last of the Mohicans after his son <laughs> Uncas dies. Okay. Earl's fate has swept away all my kinsmen, Earl's and their courage to their final destiny. I must follow them. <laughs> Wheeloff tries to revive him. It's mighty pythons. He tries to revive him, but he can't. Three times. Why? It's probably baptismal imagery. But we're told 
by the voice of the poet. That was the last word of the old warrior, his final thought, before he chose the fire, the hot surging flames. What, Beowulf chose hell? No. What's the fire of the hot surging flames? His funeral pyre. From his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous. And you've got a gloss. Literally, the dome, the fame of the truth fast. An ambiguous pronouncement. It's really not all that ambiguous. It's pretty clear what the poet means. To seek the righteous judgment. Beowulf, like Hrevel, chose eternal life. What does Hrothgar say in his homily to Beowulf? Choose eternal counsel. Kind of weaving in without directly, explicitly saying it, Christianity. Because everything in the pagan belief system is temporal. It doesn't last. Because of Ragnarok. So, we're, we get a long passage describing what's going on. And Beowulf's men come out. And what does Wheelof tell them? 2864. The man who would speak the truth must say that the Lord who gave you those gifts of treasures, the soldiers' trappings you stand in there, he entirely threw away. A lot of good. That armor and those weapons did Beowulf when he gave them to you. We used to swear, he says, on the meat benches. Yeah, Beowulf, we'll be with you thick and thin. As Cap says to Bucky Barnes, with you to the end, okay? No, <laughs> they weren't. By the way, what is that an echo of? Go back to the prologue of the poem, and what are we told? A good young man will do what? Distribute from his father's treasure, for what purpose? So that in his old age, when he has needs, men will stand with him. Beowulf only has one man. Maybe he's not such a good judge of character. All right? So, Wheelof banishes them. They become exiles. They lose everything. And then he orders the battle work announced to the camp. Well, what camp? Remember when I talked about Tacitus early, early on? And said Tacitus in his Germania describes the Germanic tribes and what they would do, they'd get ready to fight, and the people would come up and they'd get on the hillside and watch, and the women would go, look, boys, it's what you're fighting for, etc." Well, the implication is Beowulf goes off with his 12 men, and a bunch of people follow. But they don't go all the way down because, you know, dragon. So they stay <laughs> off to the side. They don't see, and now Wheelof sends a messenger. And what's the messenger say? Now this folk may expect a time of trouble when this is told to the Franks and Frisians. Franks, that's the Hetwara, the Hugas, Frisians, Elak. Why? Beowulf's dead. The word is out. And the word is out. And what are the Franks and the Frisians and the Hetwara and the Hugas? All want a piece of the Geats. Because of the feud that Helak started. So you're going to have that group of people, Frisians, Hetwara, etc. And what else? And we get the third reference to Helak's Frisian raid. Oh, yeah. And then there's the Swedish problem. You could look at it this way. The Russian problem, the North Korean problem, and the border problem. What's we lost point? We're screwed, folks. <laughs> we are screwed. We are going to be hammered. And the messenger says, gives us a pretty good idea of what is going to happen because he talks about the women and children. And what are they going to do? They're going to be exiles. Because the men are going to be dead. 
forget what happens as a result of Beowulf fighting the dragon. And Wheelof tells us, let's see here, let me real quickly before we finish. Um, can't find the exact lines. Where Wheelof tells us that we couldn't persuade Beowulf Yeah. Uh, 30, 76, 77. Okay, two minutes. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man. I think that's a biblical parallel. Through one man, death entered the world, and many died as a result. As we have now seen, we could not persuade our dear prince shepherd of a kingdom with any counsel that he not greet that old that gold guardian let him lie where he had long been okay by saying we could not persuade him what is we love telling us we tried people we really tried we tried to tell beowulf let the sleeping dragon spot but he wouldn't do it why because he held 3084 to his high destiny. He's a dragon killer. And the poem ends, skipping to the very end, with these last three lines. So they bury Beowulf. What else are we told, by the way? The narrator tells us the gold in the hoard is cursed. The only person who can get that out is the person whom God chose. Question remains, did God choose Beowulf? Because if he did, who brought the treasure out? Mm. We off. Not Beowulf. Well, what happens? All dead. <laughs> Eventually. So the poem ends talking about Beowulf. The men are riding around Beowulf's tomb, and they're chanting and singing. And they said, 3180, that he was of all the kings of the world, the mildest of men, I don't know. I can think of people a little bit milder. <laughs> you know, Pope Francis seems pretty mild. He's a pretty <laughs> easygoing guy. Uh, most gentle. Uh, squeezes people to death. The kindest to his folk. That's good. I mean, he is kind to his people. He didn't mean for them to all die because he killed a dragon. And the most eager for fame. Loth the earnest. Because of that final word, a lot of quote-unquote Christian allegorists of the poem, that is, they read the poem as allegory, they say Beowulf is damned because he's eager for fame. But the poet isn't saying that. The poet is saying Beowulf, within the Germanic tradition, he follows it perfectly. It's the three things that come before that that don't follow it perfectly. And I am going to make some comments about Beowulf just briefly when we come back on Tuesday. Never. So enjoy your freezing spring break um, if you stay in Murfreesboro. And over the break, sheesh, read Landval, read all of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and read the general introduction to uh, the general prologue to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. <laughs>